So because uh, not all services are going to be sold on the product market due to the uh, presence of the matching function, you'll always have some services uh, so that are sold, of course, and some services that remain uh, unsold. Um, and so if we take a step back, what does that mean for the households that are trying to sell services? Well, it means that they are not going to use, uh, they won't be able to sell their entire capacity. Uh, so part of the productive capacity of each household is going to remain idle um, because no customers showed up to actually uh, purchase the service uh, that they were selling. Um, so, in fact, um, we can compute the idle capacity and we can also represent the idle capacity as a function uh, of tightness, um, which is something that uh, would be helpful later on. So what we saw um, when we describe the product market is that uh, each service is sold um, with probability f of x, right? <coughs> so um, now, if we look at a household, we know that the household has h services for sale. So if we wanted to be very precise, If we looked at one household, we would know that the number of services that are sold by a household would be a random variable uh, with a binomial distribution with a probability of success, which is f of x, and the number of tries uh, in your binomial distribution, which would be h, the number of services uh, that are uh, for sale. So that's if we want it to be exact. So it's a binomial distribution with parameters f of x, which would be uh, the probability of success. So here the event would be a success if you're able to sell your service. And h, that would be the number of tries. Uh, okay, um, and uh, so that if we wanted to be very accurate, different household would therefore, in practice, sell different amount of services, but all with that binomial distribution. Uh, but so then, in a case like this, the expected number of services sold, of course, would be the uh, average of your binomial distribution, and that would just be f of x times h, um, have we seen uh, before. So now, to simplify, and that's why we made the assumption that we, we are dealing with large households. We deal with a large household, and we're going to omit any randomness at the household level. So to simplify, we're going to assume that each household uh, sells exactly f of x times, I times h services. We just assume away the randomness. Okay, uh, and so this is for one household that the number of services sold. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, well, so it means that you know, the household has uh, laborers that are waiting in the shop to provide services and in total, if they were working all the time, they would have sold eight services, but because of the matching process on the market, they're only able to sell a fraction f of x of these services. So what that means is that um, because the workers for the household are always there, ready to provide services, 
but they are actually not always uh, called upon to provide these services because sometimes you have no customers who are asking for the service. What that means is that uh, the workers who are part of the household, they are busy uh, a fraction f of x of the time and they are idle a fraction 1 minus f of x of the time. Um, so this is for a given household and of course that's true in any uh, that's true in any household because all the households are exactly the same here and we're using a representative household for the analysis. Um, so at the aggregate level, uh, if we look at the entire economy, the rate of idleness is going to be uh, 1 minus f of x. And so the interpretation of this rate of idleness is just the share of the time uh, where workers are idle. And here they are idle because um, they are just waiting for the customers to show up. So in each specific shop, you know, at any point in time, sometimes you have customers who are here buying service, and sometimes you have some you have uh, no customers at all. So this is the rate of uh, idleness, and if you want f of x, uh, is going to be the you know it's it's going to be just the rate of um, utilization of the workers in uh, this economy. What's interesting in the model as well is that um, the rate of utilization f of x uh, is going to be proportional to uh, measured productivity. So you know, in, in RBC models, um, productivity plays a big role. Um, and so they assume that um, productivity is um, pro-cyclical. So we are more productive in good times, less productive in bad times. And that's what drives uh, the business cycle in this type of model. And this evidence on the procyclicality of productivity that comes from uh, measuring productivity as a solo residual. Um, but actually, if the world really is uh, a world with slack, uh, then variation in utilization are going to look like uh, uh, variations in, in measure productivity. So you may, you, you know, doing the solo procedure it may look like uh, productivity varies, and that's what motivated you know, all the work on the RBC model. But actually, uh, it may not at all be variation in productivity because in a mod in model with Slack organized around a matching function, like what we are talking about here, um, productivity is completely constant. Um, nevertheless, if you do the, the if you measure a solo residual, um, you would get a residual that varies. Uh, over time, but that's because uh, utilization varies. So indeed, if you remember, um, the solo procedure is you assume that you have output, and um, usually you assume that output is um, productivity or technology. Uh, you know, you can call it say TFP. Uh, it's something like uh, at a high level, it's TFP time. Uh, you know, a, a production function f of capital and labor. So you have capital, labor, they go, and f here is just a production function. So you have your production function, take capital and labor, and then you have TFP, uh, and that gives you output. And so the idea is that you measure uh, 
uh, output. This is measured. And capital and labor are measured as well. And so basically, all the fluctuation in output that you cannot uh, explain by fluctuation in capital and labor, uh, you assign them to a fluctuation in a total factor productivity or technology. Uh, so this, the TFP is going to be measured as a residual. So if you see capital and labor uh, says that moves uh, smoothly over time, um, but then you still see um, fluctuation in output, then you're going to assume uh, that your residual varies. But actually, if the real world is a world organized uh, around you know, matching function and with Slack, um, you can have fluctuation in output even if capital and labor are uh, fixed. Uh, that's because the rate of utilization of capital and labor is going to vary over time. So in our model, output, which is what we denoted y, is equal to f of x. Sorry. Um, is equal to um, utilization, which is what we denoted f of x time, uh, you know, capacity, productive capacity. And that's what we denoted um, k. And um, productive capacity itself. You know that's going to you know that's going to be although we don't model it here we uh, we said you know because um, labor supply move very sl slowly over time capital stock move very slowly over time you know the uh, amount of services uh, that can be produced and you know technology moves even more slowly over time the amount of services can be produced by all of this we assume that we take it as, as given we denote k but this you know if you wanted to explain it uh, this is itself, you know, a function of um, capital and labor in the background. So anyway, um, once you observe um, f of uh, output and you look at fluctuations in output that are not explained by fluctuation capital and labor, because we know capital and labor you know, move slowly over time, so that's going to create also a change in output over time, you look at all the fluctuations that are not explained by that. In our model, you can still get such fluctuations. That's because the utilization rate f of x uh, is going to uh, is going to vary. And so, in fact, if um, everything that you call TFP and that you measure as a residual, uh, it could very well be, in fact, uh, just fluctuations in in utilization. Um, and so. If the real world is actually a world with slack, um, and you do the solo procedure to measure TFP as a residual, you would get something that looked like fluctuation in measured TFP or measured productivity. But in fact, it's just because your view of the world is misspecified because in the solo procedure, you don't allow for fluctuation in utilization. And so everything, all these movement in the residual, you assign them to change in TFP when in fact, they are just changes in, uh, in utilization. Um, So changes in capacity utilization look like uh, changes in measured TFP or measured productivity. That's an important result to know that, uh, that you know that there are other possible sources for fluctuation in uh, in measure productivity. So the last thing I want to do now um, is to uh, just plot and figure out how um, I represent basically output as a function of the capacity in the economy and as a function of tightness, because that's something it's a diagram that we'll use. Um, very much uh, moving forward. That's just to wrap up and summarize a bit what we've seen. Um, so to be able to plot that uh, output as a function of tightness and capacity, we need to figure out what are the proper properties of f of x. 
and that we've done uh, most of the work already. So, uh, and you remember that f f of x, so we did the calculation as a function of tightness is just 1 plus x minus gamma minus 1 over gamma. This is something that we showed earlier. Um, so what are the properties? So first we'll have that f of 0 is equal to uh, is equal to 0. We also have that f at plus infinity is going to be equal to 1. We also have f prime of x is positive, so the function f is increasing, it starts at 0 and has a total of 1. Now the question is that, um, do we know anything about the curvature? And indeed, we can show that f of x is a concave function. Uh, and so how can we show that? Well, so we have to show that f, the second derivative of x is negative. Uh, that's because the second derivative of x is negative. And how can we show that? Well, it's not very hard to show. Uh, so what is f prime of x? So if we take the derivative of the function we got there, so it's the composition of several functions. So first, we can take the derivative of our outside exponent. So it's minus 1 over gamma times 1 plus x minus gamma to the power of minus 1 over gamma minus 1. And then, so we have a composition of functions, and we need to take the derivative of what's inside, the 1 plus x minus gamma. And the derivative of 1 plus x minus gamma, the 1 disappears. We just have a minus gamma times x minus gamma minus 1. OK, so this is our derivative. Uh, and you know, here we can easily uh, simplify things. So we have minus 1 over gamma here, and minus gamma here. These things disappear. Uh, they cancel out to get, to get a 1. And so what we have is x minus gamma plus 1 times 1 plus x minus gamma. And here you have minus gamma plus 1 divided by um, gamma. All right, and here what we notice is that um, both factors uh, are factored by minus um, gamma plus 1. So it means that I'm able to bring my uh, the x um, inside as an x gamma, and so I'll get uh, x gamma plus x gamma times x minus gamma minus 1 plus gamma divided by gamma. So I can simplify this like this. Um, so here what I've done is I've just uh, brought inside an x gamma. And here you have x gamma times x minus gamma. Um, so this is going to simplify and just going to be a 1. Um, and so here you recognize, um, so you'll have 1 plus x gamma minus 1 over gamma. To the power of 1 plus gamma. Okay, if I just separate these things, and here I did that because the 1 plus x gamma to the power of minus uh, 1 over gamma, that's just what we had called Q of x, uh, the, buying, the buying probability, the probability that a vacancy is actually, uh, you know, that a visit to a shop is actually successful. So this, you know, we can simplify to Q of x, 1 plus gamma. And, and uh, that's, that's kind of convenient because um, we know that the function Q is decreasing in x. We showed that uh, we know that f is increasing in x, q, the bank property, is decreasing in x. And so from that, we, we know that f prime of x is uh, decreasing in x. And uh, as a result, f prime of x is decreasing in x. So we've just verified here what I said earlier, that um, f second of x is negative. So you have a function that's concave here. Um, because the derivative is decreasing in x. Okay, so that will. Uh, so it means that if I plot 
if I plot uh, the function f as a function of x, f of an instinct dot at 1, here I have 0. So we know that f of 0 f of 0 is simply 0, and we know that we have a function that's increasing, that's concave, and that asymptotes to 1, so it's going to look something like this, okay, as a function of x. Uh, that's just f of x 